button. Here we go. <coughs> um, well, Brian, can you keep admitting people? I have to make you a co-host or something. What is this? Uh, <coughs> Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> thank you for joining Mass Peace Action's um, educational talk on rank choice voting. As you may know, rank choice voting is on the ballot in November, so it's high time we all learned about it. Mass Peace Action uh, signed up to support it, uh, I don't know when, a year or two ago when the organizing first started to get it on the ballot. And uh, we're pretty excited that <clears throat> it's actually coming to pass and the voters will be able to adopt it in November. Um, I can remember back when Jill Stein was trying to get ranked choice vote <clears throat> uh, on the ballot about 10 years ago. And uh, so this is the second and even better try. Um, CD4, Congressional election, as, as a few of us were discussing a minute ago, is a poster child for the need for ranked choice voting when you had, what, seven or eight candidates contending for that congressional seat. Uh, the one who was victorious was the most ideologically extreme of all of them, and probably uh, under ranked choice voting wouldn't have won. Um, so the progressive vote was divided where the more conservative vote was. Uh, combined in one candidate, and he won. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton to Andy Anderson. He's been organizing for Ranked Choice Voting for three and a half years. <clears throat> and he's showing us Amherst Mass and his background where he, did you say you teach there, Andy? Uh, I do some teaching there, yes. Yeah, so uh, welcome Andy and take it away. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> Coming to, to you from the lovely Norwatic Valley, uh, uh, off the Connecticut River Valley. And uh, you can see Amherst College in the background where I work full time. And off to the left, you have University of Massachusetts at Amherst where I teach as an adjunct. And far in the distance in the back, you'll see, you can see the Peace Pagoda and, and Leverett. So um, I'm sitting about uh, 400 feet above where I actually live. Um, so I have been interested in this topic of ranked choice voting for over 20 years. Um, first heard about it when I talked to some uh, Green Party activists and went and got a book and learned about it and thought it was a great idea. Didn't have much of a chance to do anything about it. Um, then I noticed right after the 2016 election that we had a group in Massachusetts that was working on it, and I jumped right in and have been working with them ever since. And the, um, the presentation I'm going to do for you is a one that uh, we do for the button I want. Um, it describes uh, an awful lot about uh, ranked choice voting and about our campaign. And so um, uh, probably best we can, we're gonna, we're gonna talk for about half an hour or a little less and then we'll take questions at the end. So um, if there's something quick you want to ask, you, you don't quite understand what I said, um, go ahead and ask, but otherwise please hold your questions for the end. And, and you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat if you want while Andy's talking. You could also you could also raise your hand uh, <clears throat> by using the tool under participants, and then we'll know that you have a question. We'll call on you later. It's Jess on question two. Jess on question two. That's right. That's it's a ballot initiative uh, that will be on the November ballot all the way across Massachusetts. All right. So here's a basic agenda of what we're doing, why our current voting system called plurality voting is a problem, why ranked choice voting is a different system, but it's the solution, um, how ranked choice voting works, what a victory in Massachusetts could mean for the whole country, um, a bit of the recent history of ranked choice voting, and then how uh, we can support the Yes on Two campaign. So here's the problem. First off, what's commonly called first past the post elections, um, or plurality voting 
where simply the person who has the most votes wins, even if that's 22% of the vote. Um, obviously, it fails to guarantee that the winner has a majority support. Um, we can have spoilers because two people of uh, similar background or ideas, but maybe different enough, they'll split the vote. And then someone who's completely different can win as a result. Um, because of vote splitting, it discourages candidates from running. They don't want to throw an election to someone they really don't like. Um, it, as voters, it limits our choices in the voting booth because anyone other than the major two parties is poo-pooed as having a chance. Um, we have to strategize about, gee, do I vote for who I really want or vote for someone who can win? Um, it rewards negative campaigning. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, um, how that works. And because you have a, two parties and sometimes a lesser of two evils question, it, we have voter apathy. So we have low turnout in elections. Let's see, my slides have stopped. There we go. Oops. We caught up. All right. All right. So here's a basic idea of the problem with plurality voting. Suppose you have two candidates. Candidate B has 61% support to candidate C with 39%. Um, no problem. Candidate B is going to win the election and they have supportive majority. But suppose that candidate A enters the race. And being somewhat similar to candidate B, they, some of the support for candidate B then shifts to candidate A. Now candidate A still doesn't have enough support to win, but candidate C suddenly has the most votes and they're the winner. We don't consider this to be a democratic system. Surprisingly, we've been using it in a lot of places for a long time, but it does not live to up to our ideals and aspirations of ensuring majority support for our representatives. So here's a good example. Last year, uh, the mayor of uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, um, he was indicted for uh, something by the feds and a uh, recall election uh, was was launched. Um, the, in the, uh, during the election, the first question voters were asked was, should we keep him in office or should we recall him? 39% said keep in office, 61% recall. The next question they were asked is, who should we replace him with? And he was still on that ballot because maybe everyone is actually worse than him, we don't know, but he's allowed to run again. He gets something similar to his support of not recalling 35%, and then you had four other candidates in the race. They got 34, 14, 11, and 6%. Guess who won re-election? Osio Correa became mayor once again, or survived, I should say. Um, and this is a perfect example of vote splitting, where you can see that 65% of the voters voted against Correa, but instead he was actually still re-elected. So here's another example from two years ago, the third congressional district. Uh, we had 10 candidates running. Um, Trahan won a little under 22% of the vote, but what that meant is 78% of the voters did not choose the winner. Now, we may think she's a fine representative, but we don't really know who would have won if the voters didn't have to split their votes in so many ways. So, um, we would like to be able to say that if she's, you know, we would like her to be able to say, and she would like to be able to say that she had broad support in the election. But in fact, she can always say that, oh, I only know that my core supporters voted for me. I don't really know how the rest of the district feels. So she's uh, uh, looking forward to finding out. Um, I guess she probably won the primary again, if so I didn't actually check. Um, but hey, we can talk about the fourth congressional district this year. Ripped from the headlines last week, um, Jake Alchenkloss again got about 22% of the vote, his closest uh, 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 candidate opposing him was Jesse Mermel. She got 21% of the vote. 
Um, again, we got split and 78% of the voters were not involved in choosing the winner. It was a non-majority outcome. Again, maybe um, this is a, a very, very district. Maybe election class would have pulled in majority support if it were just him versus Murmel, we don't know. But um, a lot of people are saying, well, everyone else is a progressive candidate. Um, if there were only one of them in the race, they might have won. So this happens a lot in Massachusetts. So here's the three plus candidate races. So the, those are the ones where um, you can have vote splitting and non-majority outcomes. And we see that in quite a few of them for these different races uh, over this 20 year time period, um, we have a lot of split decisions, non-majority outcomes. So it's not a problem uh, that we don't have to worry about. It's one where we often have situations. So 41% um, of the winners won, less than majority amongst all these races. And going even further back, your 2000 Florida state far, far away. You probably all remember this. You had George Bush and Al Gore and Ralph Nader. The difference between George Bush and Al Gore was 537 votes. So George Bush was declared the winner. Um, some people call Ralph Nader a spoiler, but what we say is it's the system that's spoiled, the system that can allow this kind of vote splitting to occur. And more generally, 2016, if you look at states that were very close together, um, you may know that electoral votes are typically given to whoever is the plurality winner in these states. So all the colored states here had a winner who only had a plurality of the vote. If it was blue, it was for Clinton. If it was red, it was for Trump. Um, but the lighter the color, the closer the margin. You had third parties, libertarians and the greens in there um, with votes. and the result was that um, any combination of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, uh, if Clinton had managed a um, majority support there, that would have changed the outcome of that election. Or so several ways that we might have had a different outcome there if we didn't have this form of uh, vote splitting going on. Okay, let's see. My slide presentation is pausing again. Okay, here we go. All right, so we have a solution for you. It's called ranked choice voting. Uh, it fixes this political dysfunction and spoiled system that we've been talking about. So here are the benefits. It ensures the candidate with the most support wins. It discourages negative campaigns because in order to win, candidates have to be able to convince other voters that they deserve majority support and they can't do this by denigrating these other candidates. So. They tone down the negativity. It doesn't mean they don't critique others' records. It just means that they don't um, go nasty uh, like so, like happens so often now. Um, and that's so they can pull in additional support. So it, re it reduces the spoiler effect. You can have independents and third parties competing. Um, once they're able to compete more, suddenly voters don't have to worry about strategizing about who they want to win. They can vote for who they really want. That can give more support to these uh, independent and third party candidates. And then they start to be taken more seriously instead of just being considered also rands. Um, uh, and of course the candidate who is elected, they know they have to have majority support going forward. And so they're gonna pay more attention to the concerns of the voters instead of just focusing on a narrow core base. Um, which you may have heard something about a lot recently. Um, and then our democratic aspirations are supposed to be based, our system of governance is supposed to be based on majority, majority rule. And we have not been using that for so many of our elections. Here's a solution that makes sure that we get to majority rule. 
Okay. So by allowing us to get a candidate who speaks to a broad majority, that actually helps to unify us. It reduces the divisions between us um, and reduces uh, people at the extremes who are trying to take us in a um, different direction by dividing us against ourselves. So um, RCV is a way we can be to really be a more representative uh, country. So how do we get there? How does this work? So basic ideas, instead of voting for one candidate, you have the ability to rank every candidate on the ballot uh, in order of preference. You look at the candidates, so this is my first choice, and then you look at who's left and say, well, I like this person second, this person third. This sort of ranking is something that we do all the time in our uh, daily life. You know, what's our first choice of something, with, uh, uh, whether we're picking a movie to go to or watching a TV program that might um, compete with others. But ranking things is a very natural thing for us to do. And it's rel relatively simple. Um, what the, the way ranked choice voting works then is everyone first choice gets their vote. All those are counted. If a candidate has a majority of the vote, they win. If they don't have a majority of the vote, then we have an instant runoff taking place where we remove the weakest candidate. So whoever had the least number of votes, they're off the island, so to speak. Um, and then everybody votes again. If you happen to vote for the candidate who was eliminated, well, your vote goes to your next choice on your list. So it's uh, a process of everyone voting again and again and again until we find someone who has the support of most of the people. Um, and it's a case of, uh, it's, it's similar to what's done in actual meetings where you can vote multiple times. And we know we can get to a majority because we, we do in fact, you know, force the weakest candidate to lose, to, to leave the race after every round, okay? Right now we make everyone leave the race except the person who had the highest number of votes. Here we start at the other end and remove the weakest candidates. Okay, so um, one candidate here instead, you get to rank everyone. So you can say, here's my first choice. Here's my second choice. Sorry, um, you'd fill in this slide with one. You find your first choice, which, which candidate is your first choice, mark that column, and then who's your second one. So you end up with a, uh, a grid where you only have one marking in each row and one marking in each column. You don't vote for more than, person, more than one person uh, multiple times here because it does not help. Your vote is always going to your top choice. Okay, here's a sample ballot from the League of Women Voters of Maine. So speaking of Maine, let's talk a bit, little bit about some history. First off, where is ranked choice voting used? Um, a lot of places. It's actually been in continuous use in this country since the progressive era, 100 years ago. Um, it's kind of come and go for various reasons I won't get into unless you ask, but uh, um, since 1941 it has been used in uh, Cambridge. I know someone mentioned that it's different um, because what they're doing is multi-candidate ranked choice voting, uh, multi-seat ranked choice voting, I should say. Um, but same idea, if it's a single seat, it's ranked choice voting. So we call them both ranked choice voting. Um, so it's being used in uh, the dark purple. We have municipal races, San Francisco and Minnesota. We have Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, in New Mexico, we have Santa Fe. Um, it's being used in some caucuses and primaries this last year, um, this, past, this past year, I should say. Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, Nevada. It was used in Indiana and in Virginia by the Republican con uh, state conventions to choose their, um, their primary, to choose their delegates um, because they didn't want to get together through the COVID. So they had a ranked choice voting uh, election of their delegates. Um, it's going to be, it's actually used in many states for overseas and, over, and military voters. Um, it's hard for them to, these are states that have runoffs of some sort where they actually have a you know, top two runoff and then you have to come back 
three weeks later and vote a second time. And so they let these people actually rank their candidates, which is the same basic idea, except that with ranked choice voting, we do it all at once in a single election and everyone can participate. Um, I'll mention that Amherst adopted it uh, and it was part of a charter, uh, new charter that they uh, adopted and it's gonna be used for the first time next November in 2021. And East Hampton also has adopted that change and will be using it in 2021 for the first time also. So it's uh, gathering steam in many places across the country. Um, Maine is interesting because they actually got it statewide. So they had it in Portland, Maine, and they were, they have a long history of independent candidates there. And they were tired of their governors and others winning with 35% of the vote. And so they adopted ranked choice voting and they, the uh, ballot initiative was very similar to ours where US senators, US representatives, governors, state senators, state rep representatives, the state's attorney and so on um, would all be part of the ranking system. Um, there was an effort to uh, repeal the law, citizens organized to reverse that repeal. Um, it's now been used in three statewide elections. We also saw where New York voters have adopted it. Um, again, starting in 2021. We like to do the same thing here in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm going to take a little sidestep back to 2018. The first use in Maine was for the second congressional district where we had Poliquin, Golden, Bond, and Hoare. Uh, a little hard to tell, but uh, Poliquin had 46.3, Golden had 45.6, Bond had 5.7, and Hoare had 2.4% of the vote but they used ranked choice voting. So Bond and Hoare were eliminated as the weakest candidates. Uh, their vote split between Poliquin and Golden, but Golden got more of that vote than Poliquin, and he ended up with 50.6% of the vote compared to Poliquin's 49.4%. So he was elected and he's now the uh, running for re-election this time around. Once again, Poliquin, uh, filed suit, tried to declare ranked choice voting as unconstitutional. Uh, that failed in the courts. There have been many people that it was tried to say it was unconstitutional and they have all failed in that process. Um, because again, it's just, it's always one person, one vote. Everyone has equal opportunity to vote. And um, it's, it's very similar to what happens in, you know, what Congress does when they elect various officials or other meetings. Okay, so if we're going to um, make changes in our democracy, it's often individual states that get, start, get started with these things. And RCD has an opportunity to be a very impactful reform to improve democracy, not just in the state, but nationwide. So Maine has done it first. Um, they recently, they, uh, the legislature there has seen the light and they passed legislation to make use of ranked choice voting in their presidential election. Um, that was, some suits are filed against that, but for the moment that's going forward. We just found out today that they're printing ballots using ranked choice voting for the presidential election. If you wanna be able to do the same thing here, we can't do it right away. We need to get it at the state level first. So we can, we want to improve our democracy, taking a step back, thinking big picture. Um, three things we can do, range choice voting helps with all three. So we want to be able to recruit better candidates. If they're not worried about splitting the vote, more people will come out. Um, it eliminates barriers to participation. Uh, we see more diversity in who our candidates are and who the winners are. More women win, more uh, candidates of color win in places that are using range choice voting. And it's a structural change um, by changing the way the candidates campaign and the way the voters think about who they're electing. Um, so these are all important changes to help our democracy. Okay, so I'll finish up just talking about how you can support the campaign. Um, main point, I saw, heard someone mention this earlier, so many Massachusetts voters have very little information about RCV. Um, this is a 
So it's a big education campaign that we are currently involved in. And we're doing a lot of phone calling to educate people about this, uh, starting after the marketing campaign and the um, CD4 campaign and others, which are very, took a lot of attention. Um, so of those that who have heard about RCV, 53% would vote yes. Um, whereas of those who say they vote no, six, or who haven't heard about it, 65% would say no. So we know that education, explaining what it is, people like the idea and they vote in favor. So uh, a lot of surveys of places where it's used, generally speaking, people would like it. So you can volunteer. Here's a website you can go to, that's on our that's on to rcv.com slash volunteer. And you can help us by calling people, putting up yard signs, um, doing other uh, activities if you have special skills. Uh, of course, you can do donate cash or running TV ads. Um, and that, of course, takes a lot of money. And so every dollar um, goes to help educate voters and help us win this campaign. Um, just mentioned the honorary co-chairs of the campaign. It's uh, yes on two is a nonpartisan solution. People recognize that this is better for our democracy. So we have Deval Patrick, Democrat, Bill Weld, Republican, Carrie Murphy, a Republican, um, a number of academics at different schools who are part of the campaign. Danielle Allen at Harvard, um, and Lawrence Summers also at Harvard, uh, Tanisha Sullivan of the NAACP Boston branch, and Steve Pavlicha of Bain Capital and a managing partner of the Boston Celtics. And then we have a long list of endorsements by various uh, politicians, Ed Markey and Joe Kennedy and Anna Presley and so on. Um, and uh, I'm actually not seeing mine on here. Maybe they're for, no, it should be on here. I have to fix that. Um, Jim McGovern, he's a long supporter. He's actually a co-sponsor of a bill that would require the use of ranked choice voting in congressional districts across the country. Okay, um, and then a lot of organizations um, that are involved in this. So we'll see mass peace action down here. Okay, so that's the uh, state of this and uh, we'll take your questions now, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy, that was a great presentation. Appreciate it very much. I'm going to take the liberty of the first question. Uh, to which races or elections in Massachusetts would be affected by this referendum question? Which ones wouldn't be? Okay, so it would be all state level races. So we're talking governor, uh, the secretary of state, the um, other um, the state's attorney, um, I don't know that's how we call it. Um, uh, in general, I guess, um, but also state senate, state house. Um, the most many of the district attorneys are elected cross district. I believe they will be in, uh, are affected by this too. But then at the federal level, it would affect uh, house house campaigns and senate campaigns, U.S. Senate. Um, once we do that, then we can come back and try and get it used, set up for 2024 to use for presidential elections. There's also a bill separately that would make it easier for municipalities to start using it at the local level. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, this measure wouldn't affect presidential elections and it wouldn't affect city elections. That's right. City and town, but it would affect state, county, and and congressional. Okay. Um, let's see what we have for questions in the chat. Um, okay, somebody named H says, I live in Cambridge, so I understand the concepts behind RCV. What you have to convince me of is how the logistics of getting all the ballots in the same place will be accomplished. Um, so, again, these are uh, all going to be state level races. The ballots will be printed by the Secretary of State and distributed to the localities um, that need particular ones. Um, and I don't know, 
the logistic, I don't actually even know the logistics of this now. I guess right now what happens is that the, the town uh, clerks add up the votes for their first camp, you know, for to, to see the first place votes. And that may still go on because that's gonna determine if we need to use ranked choice voting or not. Um, if it's not, then the ballots will probably be brought somewhere and I'm not sure how that goes about. Now, part of the part of what we can do is have the, you know, we have, after you fill out your ballot, again, we use paper ballots in Massachusetts, you fill them out, you put them into a tabulating machine. So that information is all there. That tabulating machine can also get your rankings in those cases. And so it may just be a simple matter of taking this file and it's gonna be tens of thousands of lines of you know, first choice, second choice, third choice, you know, one per uh, voter, but that can be sent to the, the Secretary of State, is uh, the simplest thing. And the, the paper ballots are always there as a backup if there's any questions about the, about the results. Okay, great. Uh, Claire Sheridan asks, what are some of the cons of RCV? Um, I haven't seen any good cons, really. Um, the one thing I personally am concerned about is that people need to be educated to make use of it. We want people to rank their candidates. Um, you have the people who are opposed to this, they're gonna say, oh, it's unfair to these people if they only rank one and their candidate is not in the final round. We say they can rank all of them and they should rank all of them to make sure that they do participate all the way through. Um, and these same people are at the same time saying, don't vote for anyone but our party. Just vote for our party, don't vote for anyone else. So it's kind of a two-faced uh, response to, to that. They say one thing to the public, but a different thing to their voters. So I, um, this has been raised again in Maine and uh, the, the judge basically says, well, you know, they have the freedom to not vote for everyone the freedom to vote or you know, to rank everyone you know we can't tell them what to do and we don't know what their minds are when they do that so the only solution here is education that's an important part of the ballot initiative is that there will be education to make sure that everyone understands how it works and what their what their options are great and i want to remind everyone if you have questions you may either type them in the chat or you can click on your name under participants where it says raise hand. And that way we'll know that you have a question. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Norma Wassel says, I live in Cambridge with RCV and would be interested in the similarities and differences. Okay, so again, Cambridge has been using ranked choice voting since 1941. They call it proportional representation because they use it in a multi-candidate race to elect their city council and their school committee. So they elect nine people to the city council, six people to the school committee. Um, the city council then elects someone called the mayor um, who has also then sits as a member of the school committee. So they have seven all together. And um, the basic idea there is instead of voting for 50% plus one, you vote for um, in the case of the city council, where you have nine seats, you vote for one tenth plus one, essentially. Um, it's, uh, they call it the quota, some people call it the threshold, they call it the election requirement. Um, and what that does is it makes sure that you get nine people with the, you know, who have more than that election requirement, and then anyone else has no possibility of getting that many votes. So it's basically the same idea. And um, they, if you get way more than the election requirement, um, some portion of your votes is transferred to the next choices. And what that, the effect that has is to actually make sure that you have a portion of representation of interests. Um, people at the low end um, who have minority interests, if they can coalesce and get something like one ninth of the votes, either directly or through ranked choice voting where we have um, vote transfers, if that, that can help um, to get their representation on the board, on the school, <coughs> on the city council. Uh, um, 
at the high distribution of uh, that it's more than the surplus, uh, that makes sure that you have majority control of the, of the city council. So you both get minority representation and majority control, um, which is what we like to see in our, uh, in our, our legislatures, essentially. So um, if you take these same ideas and simply move it to one seat um, instead of uh, nine seats, then you have uh, what we're talking about here. And so we do not, our, the initiative here is all single seat, we're not changing the seat structure at all. Um, but Amherst is also doing some multi-seat. We have uh, three uh, at-large candidates for the town and they'll be elected using ranked choice, multi-seat ranked choice voting. I see, okay. And Peter Cariani says, plurality voting in a three or more way race means that one must take into account how everyone else will vote when you decide how to vote yourself. Right. Would you comment on that? That's, that's absolutely true and that's, that shouldn't be necessary, okay? So with ranked choice voting, again, you say, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. Um, if your higher choices turn out to not have enough support, you have a backup choice. Your, next time everyone votes, your vote goes to your top choice who's still in the race. So you don't have to think at all about what anyone is doing. You just have to vote for who you're really interested in because it doesn't matter. Your, your lower choices don't matter at all until you know, you're forced to use them. So you can uh, vote for who you really want instead of having to think about, gee, can my candidate actually win? You don't have to strategize. So it's really good for voters in that way. It actually makes things a lot simpler. But I was, I'm, I'm in Newton in the, and this, this travesty of this race between nine candidates that we just had was horrible because we had, you had to figure out who were gonna be top candidates or your vote's gonna be thrown away. Um, so ranked choice voting solves that. And I think it's the major, it eliminates spoilers and it solves this problem of voters having to figure out what everyone else is gonna do, which is a complicated question. Great, thanks Peter. Um, and uh, let's see, sorry. Uh, Cheryl asks, why were the two main parties in Maine against it? Um, you, you'll probably get different answers depending on which of them you talk to, but the, certainly there's a lot of inertia and that's true amongst voters too. So we have to overcome the inertia for, you know, we've always done this, why do we have to change? Um, but if you're an elected official, you know how you got elected and you're comfortable with that. And so having to do something different is uncomfortable as well. So the ballot initiative you're seeing now, we actually have a large amount of support in the Massachusetts legislature. We have as a bill there, and, but it's not enough and it's just you know, stuck in committee. So we had to take the steps of going to the ballot initiative in order to get it passed. And some of them, you know, because we actually have ballot initiatives in Massachusetts, not every state does, Connecticut doesn't have it. We had this option. Uh, I've talked to some representatives who, who have said, well, you know, voters can make this decision. They can decide how we should be elected. So it should be their, their choice. So you get a range of responses from the different uh, elected officials about um, how this, why it's not something for the legislature to, uh, to deal with. Okay, great. We've got a question from Ian and Rachel. Um, please go ahead and speak. You got to um, unmute though. Yes, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be very, to, to, make, to do phone banking on this subject is going to be very complicated because people aren't going to understand, they only understand like a quarter of the, quest, of the sentences that you say, but do they have a, a text uh, messaging campaign system so that we can actually write it out for them to read? Uh, we are doing uh, some text messaging, yes. Uh, that is uh, one part of the campaign. Um, we also have an you know, elevator speech that we use for uh, when we talk to people on the phone. So um, 
it's really uh, basically four sentences long. So, so <laughs> yeah. Um, but we do try and get across, um, you know, the benefits. You get to vote for who you really want. You don't have to worry about vote splitting. You get to vote. Um, a candidate who's selected by the majority. Um, you have right. uh, less uh, less negative campaigns, and so on. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sarah Wunsch asks, some people are saying RCV ends up having a negative effect on communities of color, something about depressing the voter turnout. Yeah. Have you heard that, and how do you respond? Um, I have heard that. That is coming out of one particular professor's work, um, and it's been disputed. So, the, you know, it actually comes back to that other concern that has been expressed about um, who is going to vote, continue to vote for just one person. Uh, are you going to be around in like 20 minutes? Okay, Stephen, could you please mute yourself? And I can call you. Is that is that okay? <laughs> there you go. Um, right. So um, the less so again in surveys, people who are less educated or older are less likely to rank more than one. And um, even if they rank, even if they rank just one candidate, that's you know RCV is beneficial to them because their vote will continue with that candidate until they win or until they're eliminated. So they can participate in multiple rounds of voting even if they vote for this one candidate. But it is better if they continue to participate by ranking others. And this is just, an, again, it's just an education campaign. And uh, sometimes there are nooks and crannies where uh, we don't take, have that take place. And then people who might do that don't necessarily do that because they have a vested interest in preventing um, multiple rankings. So that's uh, uh, right now we have a, a large number of communities of or organizations representing communities of color who are supporting this initiative. So uh, Amplify Latinx, for example, we have a, a Boston NAACP representative on our uh, as an honorary chair of our campaign. Um, people realize this this actually can help uh, communities of color and they actually see the, the results of the, of the elections and places that are currently using it. Okay, uh, Brian Garvey asks, is the Massachusetts Democratic Party for it or against it? They are for it. We have endorsed it. And I think it was Stephen Slainer that asked, uh, he didn't see Michael Dukakis's name on the list of endorsers. Is he where is his position? Uh, I have not heard about Michael Dukakis. So I don't know if anyone has actually uh, contacted them or not. It wouldn't surprise me if we have. But, uh, sounds uh -huh. like he'd be someone who would be in favor of it. Seems that way to me too. Uh, Brian also asks, does it apply to primaries? It will apply to primaries, yes. So we tend to have a lot more people coming out for um, more of the high profile races and party primaries are a way, and parties are a way for people to come together and with similar interests and have a candidate represent them. So um, it's a, a windowing factor and you know, you'll still end up with Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Libertarians, Independents, smattering of other parties. Um, and you know, so you have five or more candidates to be voting for, um, even in a general election. So in the parties, they can use it. It actually helps to get a unified voice from the party, again, by getting majority support within the party for who their, uh, who their representative, their nominee will be. Um, so it's, it's good for parties as well by helping to create party unity. Gotcha. Uh, John Harris asked, to indicate strong support, can you vote for the same candidate for your first, second, and third choice? Uh, there is, He's been answered by Heather Hoffman in the chat. I'd like your answer yeah. to Andy. Um, there's, there's no value in doing that because your vote always goes to your highest ranked candidate who is still in the race, who has not been eliminated. So you vote for that person, your first choice, it's always going to go to your first choice until they're eliminated. 
once they're eliminated, or go to your second choice. You know, always go to your second choice. You know, until you know, they are eliminated. So either of those could end up winning. You could be voting for the same person all the way through to be the winning candidate. Um, so uh, you often find, you know, candidates who are similar enough. Um, here's where I like. Here's where I really like. Here's someone I can live with, and so on. Um, but there's no point in putting them more than once. Okay, and John Sonnen writes, the candidate garnering the least number one votes was dropped. And then the votes, uh, having trouble with reading this, uh, the votes that person had who, uh, I, can't, I can't quite read this, but I guess this is a request to go through the procedure again more carefully about how you reapportion the votes and, and deal with with, with the situation where nobody has 50%. Okay, so again, all the voters are ranking candidates. You count up all the first choices. If no one has a majority, then you eliminate the weakest candidate, the one with the first first choice votes. And then everyone votes again. If you had voted for that weakest candidate as your first choice, your vote then goes to your second choice, okay? Because that first choice is no longer in the race. So everyone's voting again, um, and you then count up all the votes. If no one has a majority, then you drop the weakest candidate in that race, in, in that particular uh, round of voting. Okay, uh, John, if, John Sonnen, if we didn't capture your question adequately, uh, go ahead and let us know. But um, um, if you're interested, I could, I've got I could it. play a little video that would that can uh, help demonstrate the idea if people are interested in that. <clears throat> well, do you think it would help the group at this point from what you're hearing? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think it will. So let me go ahead and. Uh, this is, this is How long is just it? A, just a couple minutes. Okay, why don't you do it? This is coming from Minneapolis Public Radio, um, who is. Vote for your favorite color. <laughs> the instant runoff way. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, then I want blue. And if neither of those wins, then I guess I could live with yellow. Now let's count up everybody's votes. Under instant runoff rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority. More than 50% of the votes. So, purple's ahead, but it only has seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate whoever's in last place. Sorry, yellow fans. We're going to your second choice. Two more for pink. One for purple. But no one has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye bye, bye blue. blue. Three for purple. Two for pink. And we have a winner. The instant runoff way. All right, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Great. Okay, well, I think we've run through our questions. So unless there's anything else, we'll call it a night. <clears throat> I guess I'll ask one final question, which is how can people get involved and help ask this? Right, so the, uh, again, you can volunteer. Um, so just yes on to rcv.com slash volunteer. Um, you can send us money. It's yes on rcv.com slash donate. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. Just that's yes on to rcv in both places. Um, and you can learn more at yes on rcv.com. There's a full description of uh, what's being done. What is the, uh, you can actually see the text of the ballot initiative. Um, and get more information about it there. 
Great. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Andy. Appreciate it very much. And I urge everyone to sign up and get involved with this. Ranked choice voting is part of Mass Peace Action's Peace Voter Program in 2020. Another way you can get involved with Peace Voter this fall is to work for peace, peace candidates in other states, particularly purple states, um, where Peace Action has endorsed a number of candidates and Mass Peace Action will be organizing phone banks to support those candidates. So that's another opportunity to work for peace in the next two months. Um, thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone, for turning out and have a good night. Thank you, everyone.